trying to build on yesterday's gains, a rally going into CPI tomorrow morning from New York City. Good morning, good morning. Equities up four tenths of one percent. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, we begin with the big issue. Caught between optimism and gloom, Credit Suisse considers a 50% cut to the bonus pool. China's reopening sends copper through $9,000 as investors look ahead to the next inflation print. There was uh, a lot of talk about a recession uh, around the world. At least a mild recession in the U.S. A lot of talk about uh, Europe going into a recession. People are starting to drop recession calls uh, for Europe and for the Eurozone. The plunge in natural gas prices uh, in Europe suggests that Europe may not have a recession after all. We like European equities more than U.S. equities. We're also quite uh, pleased to see China reopen. There's a very good case to be made for China assets right now. The outlook for the world economy, I think, is actually improving. And then when I look at the U.S., we're looking at economic data. These um, forecasts about uh, recession. We're looking at earnings data. And that's what makes me concerned about the rest of 2023. Our view is, is to remain pretty cautious and pretty conservative here. There's quite a bit of skepticism. It's really the U.S. versus the rest of the world. Joining us now to discuss is Crossmark's Victoria Fernandez and Morgan Stanley's Michael Kushmer. To the two of you, thanks for being with us. I want to start with you, Victoria, and just go to those recession calls and compare it to what's happening in this market. And I went through it piece by piece this morning on the Bloomberg. EM equities back in a bull market, copper back through $9,000. European banks are up more than 40% from the July lows and high yield spreads are tighter, tighter, tighter. Someone's wrong here, Victoria. Who is it? Well, I think the market is saying that they don't believe that the Fed is going to go higher for longer. And we've had the discussion before about, um, you know, how reliable is the actions related to what the Fed is saying. And the market isn't isn't going for it. They're saying, look, you're looking at lagging indicators right now. We're looking at more timely indicators. We're looking at things like temporary jobs coming down significantly, which means the labor market probably is not as strong as what the headline numbers are telling you. They're looking at some of the underlying inflation, um, the non-manufacturing numbers, and that does contain construction. So we understand why that came down some. But I think the market is basically saying, we don't believe that we need to go as far as what the Fed is saying. It's why you look at Fed funds futures. The market's saying, yeah, it's not going to be 5%. And the Fed's still saying we're going 5 to 5 and a quarter. So who's right and who's wrong? Time will tell. I think, though, the expectation, the differential in the expectation is why we're seeing this volatility in the market. Obviously, CPI tomorrow will be a key component of that. Ignore the headline um, and the year-over-year -year number. You're looking at that core number. That's what the Fed um, is looking at. That's expected to be up 0.3%. Let's see where that comes in. If we start to get a pretty steady trend here, perhaps the Fed starts to bring back some of the rhetoric that they're saying, but I don't think they're ready to make a shift just yet. Michael Kushma, do you think this market is too optimistic that recession can be avoided? Well, I, th I think it's optimistic in the sense that a lot of things have to go right, that inflation has to continue to fall at a reasonably quick pace such that the level gets to appropriate numbers. Because right now the trend is in the right place, which I think has gotten everyone excited for several several months now and has been ignoring the Fed from that perspective. But the Fed has to remain hawkish, otherwise the labor market won't loosen up enough to get wages down to the level appropriate with sort of a 2 to 2.5% two inflation target. So the point is, I think, as the market gets more optimistic, the Fed may actually push pedal to the metal and be more hawkish to try to encourage the market to not get too optimistic to make sure labor markets loosen up over the next several quarters. But the idea that inflation is going to hit the, the Fed's targets without some kind of a continued slowdown seems to me a little bit fanciful. And Michael, is this odd dynamic right now? We've got this global growth relief abroad in Europe, off the back of what's happening in China as well. And you see these monster moves taking place in EM in commodities, elsewhere in credit too, and yet Treasury yields on a 10-year are down to 358. Does that make sense to you, Michael, that we've got this cyclical appetite abroad and Treasury yields are moving lower, not higher? 
Well, I think if you think about it, what's happened the last several months, it's kind of the re reverse supply shock. You know, oil prices are down. Where, where do we peak in last summer? It was uh, over $100. Now it's down at the low 70s. Um, we have got natural gas prices collapsing, and Europe has been incredibly benef benefited by this effect. So this reverse supply shock of lower energy prices bringing down headline inflation faster boosts purchasing power. And we could see, you know, consumer spending and household spending be a little more robust. So in that sense, I think that it's not it's not un, it's not crazy what the market is, is doing right now. The question is, will it last? What well, is this crazy? The tightest high yield spread since August in the face of a sub 50 ISM print on manufacturing and on services. Victoria, can you make sense of that? No, I really can't. Look, high yield right now, I think, is a little too tight. I would expect to see yields widen pretty significantly, I think, as we go through the first couple quarters of this year. I mean, our outlook is that you're probably going to have a mild recession. So if you do, those high yields, that's where you're going to see the movement first. I mean, we have a lot of um, fixed income investors here at Crossmark. Obviously, we're looking at a more investment grade for them. We like investment grade yields right now. They have come in pretty significantly. I don't think they're going to come in um, a ton more. So you're not looking at a, a huge total return component on that. But I don't think we're going to see them widen so you can collect your coupon for a while there. So it's a good place to be at this point. High yield makes me a little bit nervous. And you look at those 10-year yields, though, and them coming down. I think it's because the market is telling you, look, we still see rate cuts at the end of this year. I don't think we're going to see it. I don't think the Fed thinks it's going to happen, but the market is telling you we're going to see that. So they are bringing those longer term inflation expectations down. That's why we're seeing the longer end of the curve kind of settle in around this 360 level. And Michael, how do you think this reconciles? We've got spreads getting tighter and the ISM getting lower. Which one improves here? Either the ISM has to bounce back or spreads are going wider. Which one is it? I think the ISM maybe have overshot to the, the downside. There's a lot of noise in the economy, sector disruptions in terms of the goods sector versus service sector. Um, I think the service sector print we saw just recently was uh, so low that almost think it has to rebound a bit next 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 month. So I think that it's it's showing ex not excessive weakness, but weakness which is not truly indicative of uh, forecasting a recession. I think that the lagged effects of lower energy prices is going to be beneficial. But again, um, inflation is coming down. And, and this is a, a good story. Inflation is coming down. Um, Fed is reducing its pace of rate hikes. A good chance to only hike 25 next month. And, you know, 5% may be the peak. Um, the question of will they hold it longer? Um, that's the question. But I think we're, bond markets are moving in to buy the dip instead of sell the rally, which is a very different mentality. Michael, stay there. Equity future is right now up a third of 1% on the S&P. Michael Cushman talked about inflation tomorrow. The latest read coming tomorrow in America. US CPI due out in less than 24 hours with Wall Street looking for some kind of deceleration. Mike McKee has more. Hey, Mike. <laughs> Hi, John. The last couple of months, we have seen CPI come in lower than expectations. So that ping pong match between the Fed and the markets generally has resulted in some big moves on CPI days. Fed can't change its forecast that quickly, but the market sure can. And look what we're expecting tomorrow. Uh, the betting is we're going to see a very good number because underlying inflation has, uh, at this point, started to really, really roll over. And that's uh, some good news. And what we're thinking, at least what economists surveyed by Bloomberg are thinking, is that there is going to be a negative print this month, down a tenth of a percent for CPI headline, which would push the uh, headline year over year down to six and a half percent from 7.1 percent. The core is supposed to go up a little bit, but not significantly. And with base effects, the core comes down to 5.7 percent. This is going to be overall good news, and it should spark another reaction in the markets. But what everybody is really going to be looking at is core services X housing. This is the uh, constructed index that Jay Powell referenced a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the idea that uh, housing they know is not a correct price in the CPI right now because it doesn't capture changes in rents quickly enough. But you take housing out and core services are really falling. So if that's the case tomorrow, look for people to start changing their Fed bets again as well. All over again. It's that super core, cool, Mike.
Is that what we're calling that, super core? Well, there is actually a super core index. So that one is trademarked and taken. But we can call it the j Powell core. There we go. We'll do that. Mike McKee, thank you. Victoria Fernandez, we've got to do two things here. So forgive me, they're difficult. Mm -hmm. One, what do you expect tomorrow? And two, maybe this is harder. How do you expect this market to respond to it? Well, I think we're going to be pretty close to expectations tomorrow, and that's pretty much priced in. So I think the market's going to say if we get close to expectations or a better number than expectations, the market's going to say, yep, this is it. Right what Mike McKee was saying. They're going to go, the Fed is going to um, lower their rate hike expectations, maybe 25 basis points at that February 1st meeting, maybe 25 in March, and that's, um, that's going to be it. And then they're probably going to continue to price in cuts later in um, and later this year the fed i think is going to push back tremendously on that i think they're going to say no we're not going to take our foot off the gas here we continue to be the higher for longer mantra that we've had for a while now if they come out um, where core goes much higher than that 0.3 that's that's expected then i think we get a pretty volatile market tomorrow. I think the, the market will be concerned that this was just a couple months of um, something just a little off, and then we're going to head back to the trend of higher inflation. This is what the Fed is scared of. This is what I think they may expect to happen, and this is why they're continuing their narrative that they're going to hike rates to that five to five and a quarter percent. Michael Cushman, final word on this one, please. I think that's exactly right. There does this seem to be an asymmetric bias for the market to be over-expecting good news tomorrow. So the, this, the risk is that we don't get as good a news as the market thinks. But on the other hand, the, there, there is a trend in place of lower inflation. So if we get a 0.2 percent print on core CPI tomorrow, maybe just because of rounding down, I think that would be taken quite quite positive. On the other hand, anything over 0.3 would be quite, I think, detrimental. But I think that in bonds, at least, they'll be quick to add. You know, we get to 370, back to 375, 380 on 10-year treasuries. I think that would elicit buying. Even in high yield and in um, IG, the absolute level of yields relative to risks to earn, to equities and earnings, you know, you get 8, 8.5%. Eight spreads have to widen a lot at the 8% starting yield to get you to, a, to underperform cash and underperform 5%. A 10-year right now, 358. Bonds rallying just a little bit on a 10-year, down four or five basis points on a two-year, going nowhere. Victoria Green and Michael Kushmer, Victoria Fernandez rather, and Michael Kushmer, will be going nowhere also. We had a bit of disruption for travellers this morning. Let's get you some updates with Abby. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Well, yeah, pretty incredible situation developing here. Here's the latest in an ongoing and fluid situation. Just a little bit before 9 a.m., the FAA said that uh, the ground stop on domestic flights that was put on just a little bit after 7 o'clock this morning, it's been lifted. Now, initially, it was planned to keep that into place until 9 a.m., so just a little bit early. And United Airlines, one airline that right around 6.30 came out and said that all of their domestic flights were grounded due to uh, this outage of the notice to air mission system late last night. They just came out saying that their flights are back in the air. But what this means, John, is uh, 3,700 flights were delayed by 830 uh, Eastern today. 640 flights canceled. Now, for today, according to data from Sirium, 21,000 domestic flights were planned to be in the air, about 1,800 uh, uh, international. So lots of kinks. This, of course, comes on top of uh, the blizzard problems a few weeks ago and Southwest problem and they are of course in the spotlight to see how their technology uh, what will happen after this FAA system outage but right now flights are allowed to fly again John a disruptive day ahead potentially for many people Abby thank you the updates coming again in about 20 minutes time coming up deep divisions on Capitol Hill when it comes to fiscal policy later this year it's going to be a showdown We'll get you the latest on who's going to lead the Treasury next year and the latest of what's been happening with these airlines. From New York, this is Bloomberg. When I hear people talk about balanced budgets, Give me a break. The first bill that you are bringing to the floor, according to CBO, adds $114 billion to the debt. So we don't need any lectures from anybody on that side about balancing the budget. Give me a break. 
Debt ceiling showdown looming in Washington. The team of Barclays warning of a difficult road ahead, writing raising the debt limit could be messier than last week's House Speaker vote. Although the X date is still months away, the Treasury's efforts to preserve its cash and borrowing authority has already begun. This coming as Secretary Yellen is reported to be keeping her post at the Treasury Department. Josh Wingrove behind that report. He joins us now from D.C. Hey, Josh, I know you've got a late night, so thanks for being with us early this morning. Let's just go straight to it. What have you learned about Secretary Yellen's future? Yeah, Jonathan, there was lots of speculation late last year about, so will she or won't she? The Biden administration has been preparing for change in its cabinet. It hasn't had any, which is really unusual at this point in an administration. And so one of the big dominoes to fall, obviously, is Treasury. And so all eyes were on Yellen, who had been sort of saying she intended to stay, but there was reporting that maybe she wouldn't or it would be sort of into mid-2023. What we reported yesterday is that Joe Biden himself asked Secretary Yellen to stay, said he needs her to continue serving in this post and that she agreed. Yellen has also signaled that she is going to serve and intends to serve uh, until the end of the first term, so the full four-year term of Biden's uh, uh, first term in office. So th these sort of sets up this scenario of uh, quite a bit of stability, sort of quashes that speculation. It's a little unclear how much, you know, fire was under that smoke. Was this just chatter or not? But it was enough that Joe Biden felt the need to talk to her directly make that ask and have her commit to stay on. So, so Treasury just, will, will, be, will be staying put, John, for the time coming. You spent a bit of time with the president. I just wonder how high up this debt ceiling debate is on his agenda at the moment. Josh, do you think that was a factor behind the decision to get ahead of this, to say that Secretary Yellen's sticking around? I can't say for sure, but I suspect strongly that it is. I mean, this is really uh, among the top of, top of their priorities here. They are watching what's going on with the House Republicans and Democrats uh, in the White House are sort of shaking their heads. Uh, but they're clear-eyed about the fight that's coming. The questions are whether uh, concessions will be sought by Republicans on things like Social Security and Medicare, uh, whether that will sort of be held hostage in the debt ceiling talks. They do not want that. We did ask a couple of days ago the White House, hey, are you considering any extraordinary measures, you know, hashtag mint the coin, et cetera? Uh, <laughs> but they, but they, they say no. What they want is a clean increase of the debt ceiling. They do not want to go down this road of haggling over the debt ceiling, whether they'll have that luxury, I think is really unclear right now. The target date continues to shift. No one really knows, right? But it looks like sometime in the middle of summer is when this will really sort of come to a head. And at that point, with Treasury looking to turn to its extraordinary measures to try to drag out as much time as it can, I think that's when Joe Biden wanted a steady hand at the wheel, and that's why he asked Secretary Yellen to be there. We're doing it all over again. Just a final word, Josh. The president not exactly getting some rest this morning. You're not either. And I imagine Pete Buttigieg is pretty depressed after the Christmas he had, ah. given how busy he was with Southwest. So, Josh, can you tell me what's going on with these airlines and what's going on with the FAA? Yeah, I mean, the latest is... Uh, yeah, Pete has a lot of files on the go, it seems, these days. Uh, the latest is that things are, are seem to be uh, turning around right now. And so uh, Joe Biden, of course, this morning uh, uh, saying that this is, was affecting, uh, excuse me, I'm just reading the notes sure. here, affecting only uh, takeoffs, not landings. So this is not a sort of, you know, Die Hard 2 scenario where people are sort of <laughs> circling in, in panic. Uh, but it seems like things are coming back in the right direction. But, of course, it's just another series of delays for people after the holiday delays concentrated on Southwest, of course, uh, that they saw. So um, uh, Buttigieg's secretary has really tried to sort of, you know, flex the muscle of the administration here, but they'll be sort of uh, asked to answer for what the heck happened this morning with the FAA. And nobody wants a die-hard scenario, that's for sure. Hey, Josh, no, thank you, buddy. No. It's good to catch up, mate, Thanks. as always. Josh Wingrove down in Washington, D.C. I want to cross straight over to the panel just for a final word with Victoria Fernandez and Michael Kushmer, who are back with us. Victoria, we've spent a lot of time talking about the potential for recession in America, a slowdown abroad, even with the reopening out of China. You've been buying. You've been buying Apple. You've been adding to JP Morgan. Can you tell me why? Yeah, I mean, look, I think you have to be opportunistic in these markets. I don't think you're going out there and you're trying to throw a Hail Mary. I think you're trying to go down the field yard by yard, and that's what we're doing. So you take a name like... Verizon that was up 11% last month, you trim that. You take a little bit off the table and you go into some names, names we already owned, names that we were underweight, we've been underweight in Apple, then adding a little bit to that in order to build that position back up, it's some advantageous pricing because we think the second half of this year will be a better um, a better year for us, and we'll be able to see some return there. So it's not necessarily a buy the dip, go in and buy everything. It's be selective. Find the names that have that are good quality, strong balance sheets, 
good management teams that we think are going to do well. We like the financials going forward, so we think it's an opportunity to go in and add to some of those names. Michael, are the opportunities at home or abroad? I think the opportunities are increasingly abroad in, in emerging markets in particular. As you mentioned, emerging market equities have had a turnaround, and we've been waiting for a couple of things to happen. One, for the get to the peak of the Fed rate hiking cycle, which is, seems to be close at hand. Secondly, um, the dollar has stopped going up. Um, it may not go down a whole lot, but at least it's stopped going up. So a lot of the pressure coming to emerging markets is dissipating, and these countries have, in many cases, have a much higher real interest rates than, the, than exist in the United States or other uh, developed industrial countries, and they're starting to look increasingly attractive as their monetary policy cycles turn over as well. I just wonder how sustainable these moves are, Victoria. You take a stock like Caterpillar, which so many people are talking about this morning. We spoke to Chris Verone this morning of Strategus about it. That stock bottomed at the end of September on the same day that the dollar index topped. And I don't think that's a coincidence, Victoria. I'm trying to work out how much of this is sustainable. Yeah, it's a tough question, Jonathan, and I don't really have a good answer as to how much is sustainable, but I think you have to look at the momentum and the trends that we're seeing. Look at copper. Look at the steel stocks. Steel stocks have been doing tremendously well over the last month or so. And industrials, I mean, they're not complete leaders in the market, but their momentum is turning better. I know Chris had some work done um, on the industrials not too long ago that he talked about. So I think you have to look and see where these trends are. I don't think we're actually in a sustainable bull market right now. Like I said, we think we're probably going to have a mild recession. And if so, that means we haven't reached the bottom. You don't reach a bottom before the recession. So we actually think there's going to be some more pullback. I would be, again, be cautious, be selective. You can go U.S. International is not a bad place either because of some of the changes that we've seen in inflation expectations and growth in Europe. So I think you have some opportunities there. I wouldn't say that this is a sustainable bull market at this point. Well, pick your poison. Either we haven't seen the bottom or we escape recession. And that's the debate right now. Victoria Fernandez, Michael Kushma, to the two of you, thank you. Coming up the morning calls and later, earnings expectations are still too high. And Monday's Monica Dufan on why Europe is now less risky than the United States. So many people starting to get on that train. That conversation coming up shortly. Live from New York this morning. Good morning. About 20 seconds away from the opening bell. Equity futures going into it, up a half of 1% on the Nasdaq 100, up four tenths of 1%, trying to build on the gains of yesterday's session, going into CPI tomorrow morning. The opening bell in New York City rings, switch at the board and get to the bond market. Yields look a little something like this. They come in four or five basis points on a 10 year to 357, 42 to start the year, a rally at the front end, the two year. The yield lower through most of the year so far in the face in the face of some hawkish Fed speak. Let's see if we get more of that later this week after CPI tomorrow morning. In the FX market, Euro dollar holding on to 107 and having a little look at 108, 107.68, up a third of 1%. And crude, look out for stockpiles data later, up 2% on crude. WTI, 76.60. About 20 seconds into this, equities up by a half of 1% on the S&P and the Nasdaq, up by a half of 1% also. The number one sector to watch at the open, the airlines, FAA system outages disrupting US travel, flights now resuming, and airlines feeling the consequences. For more, let's get to Abby. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Well, not surprisingly, Southwest is feeling the pain the most because, of course, just a couple of weeks ago, about 17,000 flights were canceled because of their outdated computer systems. So today, of course, we have a disruption all over the map in the U.S. Uh, with the disruption relative to the notice for two air systems missions system. It conveys advisory information essential for flight operations. That happened last night, and then it caused uh, United Airlines to cancel so all domestic flights this morning, a little bit after 6.30 and then a little after 7, the FAA grounded all flights. Now the FAA has said that, quote unquote, normal air traffic operations are resuming gradually. They're working uh, to really resolve these issues. Not surprisingly, all the stocks are down. But again, Southwest uh, the most relative to the overall impact for uh, flyers today and the airlines today from a fundamentals perspective. 3,700 flights had been delayed until about 8.30. 640 flights were canceled, 21,000 flights. 
flights domestically are expected to fly today, how much disruption uh, works through the system, we don't know. But one really interesting thing, John, uh, this is surprising to me, the airlines are one of the best sectors on the year, up nearly 14 percent. It's not clear, entirely clear why, uh, but today is just a small blip uh, for these big, big gains. Take a look at that right now, up again about 14 percent on the year. Yeah, today, what a run. Yeah. Abby, thank you. So not hugely disruptive for the stocks, but potentially hugely disruptive for you. Over at LaGuardia Airport, Kriti Gupta, Bloomberg's very own joined us. Hey, Kriti. Yeah, good morning, John. You are, of course, talking about those delays that Abby was just discussing. But one of the key pieces of the equation is how much damage you are going to see throughout the rest of the day. Southwest, for example, very specifically saying in an email statement to Bloomberg News, talking about some of these schedule changes that are going to continue throughout the day. A similar story when it comes to United. They're talking about delays, cancellations, a lot of which are going to last through the rest of the day. The good news, though, John, is simply this idea that it's been a one or two hour delay for the domestic flights, which is throwing a little bit of the schedule into chaos. But going later into the day, a lot of the international flights, the real money makers for a lot of these airlines, they are still on track. You're hearing from a lot of the airports internationally. Think London Heathrow, Charles de Gaulle as well. They aren't seeing any interruptions, whereas, for example, Logan International in Boston, Atlanta, even Newark are starting to see a little bit more pain when it comes to those domestic flights. Incredibly, thank you. Looking forward to your reporting from there throughout the day on TV and radio. Bloomberg's pretty good to there. Another stock to watch, Apple, just about positive on the day by almost a tenth of one percent and rapidly going in the wrong direction, delivering another blow to suppliers. The company planning to start using its own screens in 2024, leaving partners like Samsung and LG behind. Ed Ludlow, they're dishing out the pain, aren't they, the yeah, last couple they of days? Are. I mean, this is the latest in a series of moves. According to sources, this will materialize in the high-end Apple watches as soon as the end of 2024. Technologically, it's about transitioning from OLED to micro LED, starting with those high-end Apple watches and then later introducing them to the iPhone handsets. As you said, particularly for LG, which derives around 35% of revenue from Apple. Uh, we saw their shares suffer in the Asian trading session. Really interesting because it's just, as I say, the latest Bloomberg report, according to sources this week, where Apple's not just thinking about the supply chain, John, in, in terms of where those components are made and where they come from, but also owning the, the technological control over what they're doing. Earlier this week, we reported, for example, according to sources, that Apple was moving away from Broadcom for its Wi-Fi Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth hybrid modem or chipset and doing that in-house. It's really focused on chips as well. Uh, also a blow for Samsung, which has significant exposure to Apple in terms of that display uh, unit. It will be interesting, I guess, to ask the question, where will these uh, displays be built? Will they be here in the United States? Is this an, an onshoring move? But as you say, the stock kind of pairing its early modest gains now up three tenths of one percent. Hopefully we get some clarity when they report in early February. I think February 2nd is the date in all our diaries. Just quickly, Ed, some yeah. news on Tesla as well. What are you hearing? Yeah, so sources are telling me that there's a, a deal close with the Indonesian government to have a pretty comprehensive production plan over the long term in that country, a, a production facility for electric vehicles, kind of targeting a million units it's a year which is kind of in line with with Tesla's strategy globally you'll remember that in August Musk told shareholders that Tesla has plans to build between 10 and 12 factories globally and this kind of 2030 target to have annual production of 20 million units so you know we're hearing signals from the Indonesian government that this is taking place on the record but according to sources prelim talks and of course as with all deals it could fall through but interesting to see the stock buoyant this morning Ed great reporting as always Tesla up by a little more than two percent you brought a market up a half of one percent on the Nasdaq at four tenths of one percent Katie Greifert gets the challenge of the morning Katie you've got to explain what on earth is going on with this stock Bed Bath and Beyond up 18 percent John, honestly, I can't because there's a total disconnect between this company's equity and its fundamentals. It's up for a third day of gains, double-digit gains at that, up about 20% oh, at the moment. That was 30% when trading kicked off just at the bell, along with some other meme names. But specific to Bed Bath & Beyond, of course, this rally comes with this company on bankruptcy watch. The company warned of that possibility last week. That was the focus when it reported a wider than forecast net loss yesterday. It also reported a cash and cash equivalence position of just over $150 million. That's slightly higher than six months ago, but really a staggering chart there. You can see that that figure, that cash position, it's down 88% from two years ago, John. Now, wow. comp sales, they were even uglier. We're talking about down 26% in the third quarter. That follows double-digit declines in the previous two quarters as well. 
So again, this is a company struggling with inventory on the brink of bankruptcy, but you wouldn't know it by looking at the share prices, John. Essentially a penny stock, the name all over the place. Katie, it's your job to explain that one, not mine. I'm not going there. Katie, thank you. Thank you very much. Another big debate for many of you I know. It's international versus the United States. What do you want to own? What do you want to buy? Morgan Stanley's Matt Hornback seeing a challenging backdrop for the U.S. We caught up with him just yesterday. The fiscal trajectory in the U.S. could actually look much worse as we make our way through this year versus China fiscal policy and Europe fiscal policy. You know, those are pushing in a different direction. It's really the U.S. versus the rest of the world. And there, I think, you can have some differentiation, which is, again, another reason why I think you know, the U.S. dollar can go down as global growth outside of the U.S. picks up. And Monday's Monica Defend echoing some of that sentiment, writing the following. Earnings growth is too elevated. Earnings are vulnerable to any economic downturn. The downside risks in the U.S. are high. Europe is less risky. Earnings expectations are weak. Monica, I'm pleased to say, joined us right now. So, Monica, we've got to start there. And welcome to the programme. Why is Europe less Thank risky? You. Well, it's uh, what you saw in the street. Basically, uh, when you go to expectations in the United States, they are still extremely high. Today, prices do not reflect any sense of profit recession, which uh, we do believe are in, in the cards in the, in the U.S. So, uh, to this extent, and uh, with the idea that the U.S. dollar uh, is going to get, uh, to get weaker, uh, then this is opening up in relative terms uh, a window of opportunity of European versus U.S. equities, having in mind that you need to be overall cautious. So help me clarify that. Is that a tactical call going into earnings season or a fundamental one with sustainable tailwinds? Which one is it? Well, uh, I don't think. I, it's, I think it's more uh, a tactical call, I meaning there are too many uh, uncertainty had related to monetary policy, for example, and economic cycle that might prevent us for the time being uh, to onboard a uh, structural positioning. Let's talk about the bigger call that's taking place right now. It is buying international. It's getting long EM, EM equities, and buying into this China reopening story. And Monica, the debate we've had on this studio, on this program over the last couple of days is what on earth should I be pricing? A growth rebound off the back of this China reopening story or a growth slowdown off the back of the monetary tightening we've seen over the last 12 months? Which one is it? I think that you need really to disentangle uh, the various uh, uh, economic cycle. China is one story, is driven by the reopening, and they are going to struggle uh, this winter and to uh, catch up uh, during the during the, the spring. Uh, when it goes to Europe, this is mainly dominated by the energy crisis, and we are seeing our prices softening, and this might be uh, of help. While in the United States, it's uh, uh, mostly about the the, the monetary policy that we think will stop at 525, by the way. Does that mean by EM versus DM? Is that the call? Emerging markets over developed markets? <laughs> Uh, maybe not really now, uh, but approaching the end of the first quarter, that, that might be the case. 60-40 is your other big call. You say the 60-40 portfolio is reloaded. Can you walk me through why? Because that has been terrible over the last year. Well, you know, uh, last year uh, there was no other alternative to, to equity. Now, with the current uh, yields level, um, there, there is some uh, appeal uh, that you might find out in the fixed income space. This is why you might expect this year, uh, with the rates moving higher, um, a rebalancing uh, of, and a reappealing uh, of, um, of this kind of portfolios. From an income so perspective, that probably makes a lot of sense to a lot of people, Monica, given where yields are at and given where yields weren't two years ago, three years ago, five years ago. Can you tell me about that portfolio from a diversification, uncorrelated diversification perspective? Can you tell me whether you think the positive correlation between equities and bonds does actually break this year and why you think that's going to happen? <laughs> I think this is really related to the um, inflation pattern. So uh, any time that inflation tends to stay high, uh, this is having an impact on the correlation between uh, equity and bonds and vice versa. Uh, when inflation is moving uh, lower, uh, the, uh, the correlation is, uh, is getting to, to get inverted. And this is exactly how, where we do expect to be uh, by the middle of the year when uh, we will see a regime shift from hyperinflation to inflation. And and this is when uh, you might uh, shift from a mindset of 
capital preservation into uh, risk accumulation. So uh, mind the inflation pattern, mind the EPS pattern to shift uh, your allocation by mid of the year and turn it more positive. Monica Defend, thank you. Appreciate it catching up. Her views on this market right now, international versus the United States and bonds versus equities. At the moment, your equity market up a half of 1%. 11 or 12 minutes into the session on the Nasdaq, up a half of 1% also. Earnings season just around the corner. Bank earnings kicking off on Friday. Credit Suisse weighing big bonus cuts. The slowdown in the economy and really do making almost shutting, completely shutting down uh, last year. These are not helpful factors for the bank. That conversation, I'm next. The slowdown in the economy and really deal making almost shutting, completely shutting down uh, last year. These are not helpful factors for the banks. However, there is one new thing, an additional factor, structural change, I would call it, that we haven't seen in the previous recessions on our slowdown environment. And that's, of course, uh, central banks hiking and and this is helping the overall banking sector. Bank bonus cuts making their way to Europe. Bloomberg reporting Credit Suisse is considering slashing the bonus pool for 2022 by about half. This coming before the biggest banks on Wall Street report earnings. Bank of America JP Morgan coming up on Friday morning. Team coverage starts right now with Bloomberg's Marion Haftemar in Zurich and Shanali Basak here in New York. Marion, first to you. Can you walk us through what you've learned about what might be coming over at Credit Suisse? Right, exactly. So Credit Suisse is deciding its bonus pool for last year and it's considering cutting that by about 50%. Now that comes after last year's bonus pool already being cut down by 35%. So this is just a continual cutting for these bankers. Um, and that's off the back of, you know, it's not been a great de a year for, for dealmakers. So bonuses are, are down across the street. But also with Credit Suisse in particular, there's been a lot of issues lately, a lot of profit loss. Um, so that's also factoring into this. That's the question, isn't it, Marion? How much of this is a Credit Suisse story and how much of it is just a banking story? Part of it is a banking story and then there's the Credit Suisse element that you have to add on to it. You know, it's been two years of problems, uh, management changes, restructuring, and we're still seeing that come through. Uh, they just raised $4 billion in capital, so there's, there's definitely a Credit Suisse uh, tweak to this as well. Shanali, I imagine Credit Suisse are not alone and that it's not just the Europeans, it's the American banks too. Mm, absolutely. You have the bonuses being cut across the, uh, across the banks. But listen, John, it's easier for the bankers to cut bonuses than to cut headcount. And we are seeing a lot of headcount cuts, certainly on Wall Street already. But there's a lot of sense from a lot of these banks that they want to hold on as much as they can and really not signal to a lot of firms that they are not open to hire and open for business. Remember, remember what David Solomon said just late last year, which is the talent war really isn't over. And once that bonus season hits, that musical chairs restarting again on Wall Street, the buy side picking at the scraps. That is something to watch out for. Shanali, if you've got names in mind that weren't able to hire the people they wanted to hire and they're looking to pick up the pieces from the banks that could hire and perhaps overhired over the last three years. You have to pay attention really closely here to the buy side after some of these big multi strat funds have done so well, are able to really have some leverage on fees here. Big pension funds rethinking their hedge fund strategy after a year like last year and into a potential troubled time ahead. I would also look, even on the deal-making side, the top two deals of this year, a big presence on those deals were Evercore. It was an independent investment bank. So when you look at the competition in the big banks, even on the investment banking side, it's significant from players outside of the big six. Lastly, let's not ignore the private credit firms, the private equity firms that are also uh, picking at Wall Street right now after a really troubled year in leverage, leverage finance that will keep these banks bleeding for the next couple of months as they've lost money on those deals and as the market itself has not really cleared and opened yep, up yet. That means the private credit guys are really the ones with the dry powder and the ability to hire. Shanali, let's set things up for Friday and the week after that. We had this graphic up a little bit earlier on the earnings we can expect. B of A, JP Morgan this Friday. Friday, 
Goldman the following week with Morgan Stanley. Just run us through things. What are you looking for? The Bank of America comes out with a note today saying it's Friday the 13th, and certainly it is. There's a lot of worries out there about the worst being materialized here. Remember the big consumer banks, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, uh, Citigroup, certainly, they have fallen much more than you've seen the Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley's fall, which is not what you typically see in a cyclical business like trading and investment banking. Goldman is held up better than all of them in stock market trading. But remember, for Goldman, there's a lot of questions about the big reorg, the big investor day ahead. You just got the notification to register for the investor day this morning. And so uh, a lot of stories to calculate that are very idiosyncratic, even aside from those big macro worries that could lead to potentially billions of provisions for loan losses. Yeah, we've got a busy Friday morning coming up, that's for sure. Shanali Vasek with us on Bloomberg Surveillance throughout the morning on Friday, breaking down those earnings. Thank you. And thank you to Marion Hoftemar as well, breaking down the latest reporting from our team on Credit Suisse. Your equity market at the moment positive by five or six tenths of one percent with some sector price action. Here's Abby. Hey, John. Yeah, we're looking at another gain for the S&P 500 at this point, up nearly three percent this year in just seven days. It is on below average volume today, but not surprisingly with the gain, we have most sectors higher. In fact, at this point, 10 sectors are higher. Healthcare is down fractionally. Real estate, the best sector, up 1.8 percent. That could have something to do with the fact that yields are lower. That could, in fact, of course, help uh, lending activity, but it also makes the dividends of that sector look more attractive. Consumer discretionary materials, uh, both up more than 1%. Communication services and tech uh, doing decent, up more than half a percent, John. So today, a little bit of a risk on mood, at least relative to the sector allocation. Let's check back in on the airlines. We were following them earlier on uh, those uh, flights, all domestic flights being grounded, and then uh, that being lifted around 9 a.m. At this point, the airline index on the day is higher, uh, up uh, a little bit less than 1%. And on the year, this is just incredible, up more than 15 percent. This is sort of the surprising bull year, at least early on, John. At least so far. It's January 11th. Let's yes. see how that goes. Abby, thank you. Wonderful work, as always. Just getting some headlines from an ECB official. The governing council member, Ollie Rain, speaking in Helsinki, saying interest rates must still rise significantly. If you take a look over at euro dollar, at the moment, the high of the session, 107.76, just off those highs on euro dollar of 107.70. Compare and contrast this. And let's step away from Europe and look at the rest of the world right now. The rest of the world. Here's the global GDP forecast from David Malpass of the World Bank. Global GDP 1.7% this year. That forecast half of what it was just back in June. Some perspective here. That would be the third worst forecast, the third worst year of growth in the last three decades, with the exception being 2009 and 2020. And just to put some numbers on it, US GDP, they're looking for 0.5%. Eurozone GDP, they're looking for 0%. And for China, in the low fours. Now, I want you to compare and contrast those forecasts to what we're seeing in this market, just piece by piece. EM equities, back in a bull market. Copper prices, back through $9,000. European banks, up more than 40% since the July lows. And even in the United States, high yield spreads the tightest since August. Tight, tight, tight. Tighter by more than 100 basis points from where they were just a number of months ago. The forecasters are telling you one thing, the market's pricing something else and someone's going to be very wrong and I imagine we're going to find out soon. Coming up on this program, the market moving events you need to be watching. That'll be next in our trading diary, live from New York City with your equity market shaping up as follows. About 22 minutes into the session on the S&P, positive by a half of 1%. Elsewhere on the Nasdaq, up by 6 or 7 tenths of 1%. And in the bond market, going into the inflation report tomorrow morning. Your two-year going nowhere, 4.25 on a two-year. Your 10-year going somewhere, yields lower by 4 or 5 basis points. 3.57 is your 10-year yield from New York. This is Bloomberg. Second day of gains here on the S&P 500, at least for now, about 25 minutes into the session. Equities higher by a half of 1% on both the S&P and on the Nasdaq 2. That's the price action. Here's your trading diary. Coming up, a White House news conference coming up at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Fed speak from Harker, Bullard and Barkin on Thursday. That'll follow the U.S. CPI report and another round of jobless claims. Then we just get the earnings deluge from the big banks. J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, City, Wells Fargo, all kicking off bank earnings on Friday. Then we'll hear from Goldman and Morgan Stanley next Tuesday before we close out the week. We'll get the UMIS Consumer Sentiment Survey as well. Can I just round things out with the recession debate? Neil Dutter of Renmac published in the last hour. He said many commentators continue to suggest that a recession is imminent in both the economy and earnings. I think the consensus is offsides. He said at least in the short run. Finish with this. Financial conditions are now easing and have been for a couple of months supporting economic growth 
right now. Instead of long and variable, I think the lags are short and predictable. That debate is going to go on and on as we continue this year. From New York City, that does it for me. Thank you very much for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the Open. Good luck for the rest of the trading day. This is Bloomberg.